Доброе утро. Слышно меня? Уважаемые коллеги, очень рада видеть всех вас здесь утром в Имагуру. Мне очень приятно, что мы в очередной раз открываем встречу Бивенче. Как вы знаете, это встреча... Это Встреча дискуссионного клуба, который посвящен развитию венчурных инвестиций в Республике Беларусь. Мы рассказываем о том, как развиваются венчурные инвестиции в мире, обсуждаем, что мы вместе можем сделать для улучшения и притока венчурных инвестиций в Беларуси, как мы можем менять среду, чтобы развивались росли наши страны. So there will, will be more venture funds in the US. Today's discussion topic uh, is the role of the economic development. В прошлый раз, в прошлый месяц, вы знаете, что мы проводим эти дискуссии ежемесячно. Мы задавали многим из вас вопросы, кого вы хотели бы видеть в качестве гостя, какой опыт вы хотели бы услышать. И нам было очень приятно, что многие, многие участники дискуссии хотели бы услышать опыт других государств, опыт соседних стран, опыт стран нашего региона в развитии венчурных инвестиций. Именно поэтому мы решили пригласить уникального гостя, на мой взгляд. Это американский эксперт Уилл Кардвелл, который много лет работает в Финляндии и является, наверное, одним из ключевым, ключевых экспертов в развитии венчурной экосистемы этой страны. Он в свое время создавал так называемую предпринимательскую экосистему внутри одного из крупнейших вузов Финляндии, Alta University. Он преподает также в университете Северной Каролины, преподает венчурные инвестиции, предпринимательство, инновационное предпринимательство. Ну и, конечно, сам является венчурным инвестором, партнером фонда Courage Ventures. Will, uh, yeah, that's, I, I just introduced you, <laughs> yeah, uh, Will здесь находится, я его чуть попозже приглашу на сцену, so I will invite you a bit later, yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, just introduce you and talk about your experience. Um, я позволю себе начать э, с небольшой презентации, с, не, с небольшого выступления, которое посвящено роли венчурных инвестиций э, в экономике различных стран, э, в экономике миров, э, в целом мировой экономики. Я приведу примеры, э, естественно, примеры США и и Европейского Союза в своей презентации, и мы посмотрим, как венчурные инвестиции способны влиять на экономическую среду. Итак, да, итак, так, да? Да. итак, что такое вообще венчурные инвестиции? Все-таки я помню, что в прошлый раз, когда мы обсуждали эту тему, у нас было несколько, несколько разных дефиниций да, этого термина, потому что все-таки есть официальная дефиниция, которая в общем, на сегодняшний момент является действующей в белорусском законодательстве. И есть мировое понимание этого термина. Итак, что такое венчурные инвестиции? Это инвестиции быстро растущей инновационной компании, которые способны масштабироваться. Это инвестиции, которые характеризуются естественно огромным риском, очень высоким риском по сравнению с другими инвестициями, видами инвестиций и в свою очередь потенциально высоким доходом инвестора. Почему вообще мы говорим и многие страны обсуждают роль венчурных инвестиций? Почему вообще разрабатываются стратегии инновационного, инновационного развития стран, фасилитации венчурных инвестиций в тех или иных странах? Почему об этом говорят политики, инвесторы? Почему этой темой так увлеченно занимаются многие страны? На самом деле, ведь объем венчурных инвестиций в мире не, так, не такой большой. Вот посмотрите, это цифра США. Всего 2% новых компаний, которые создаются в США, получают венчурные 
инвестиций. На самом деле это мизер, при том, что США самый крупный рынок венчурных инвестиций в мире. Это примерно 50, около 50 миллиардов долларов в год и около 5 тысяч сделок ежегодно. В Европе или там в Китае, в Индии следующие, следующие регионы по уровню инвестиций. Объем венчурных инвестиций в разы меньше, чем в Соединенных Штатах. И тем не менее, вот как я уже упомянула, мы все заинтересованы в том, чтобы в наших странах развивался этот вид инвестиций. Ответ ну, такой самый-самый простой, очень простой на этом слайде. Венчурные инвестиции – очень эффективный вид инвестиций. Вот все эти компании, логотипы которых вы здесь видите, созданы с участием венчурного капитала. Это крупные, одни из самых крупных мировых корпораций. Например, в Соединенных Штатах тех же венчурные компании с участием венчурного капитала создают Доход равный 20, примерно, по, по прошлому году, по-моему, 21%, примерно 20% ВВП, годового ВВП США. Исследования, которые проводятся в, в области эффективности влияния на экономику венчурных инвестиций, эти исследования говорят о том, что венчурные инвестиции влияют на национальные экономики в области, скажем, трех, трех аспектов. Трех аспектов. Первый очень важный – это рост инноваций. Второй немаловажный – это развитие трудовых ресурсов. И третий принципиальный момент для многих экономик – это экономический рост. Немножко о каждом из этих аспектов я расскажу. В среднем 1 доллар, инвестированный в, венчурные, в компании с венчурным капиталом, приносит в три раза больше патентов, то есть новых разработок, чем 1 доллар, такой же доллар, инвестированный в исследование, в так называемый R&D на уровне корпораций. И, естественно, компании, которые привлекают венчурный капитал, способны тратить в несколько раз больше средств на исследования. На примере... Спасибо. на примере Европы вы можете посмотреть, что 8 раз больше компании тратят на исследования венчурные компании, компании с венчурным инвестициям, чем компании, которые занимаются традиционным бизнесом. И опять же, в, говоря об инновациях, как вы знаете, инновационные стартап-компании проходят в жизнь, определенный жизненный цикл. И в самом начале пути многие из них проходят через так называемую долину смерти. Что это за долина? Почему она вообще так называется? Ну, называется она так, потому что на этом этапе умирает большая часть таких компаний. Она прекращает свое существование. Какой это период? Это как раз вот период коммерциализации технологий, когда компании только начинают работать над идеей, у них уже создан определенный прототип, и этот прототип нужно, прототип продукта выводить на рынок. Вот в этот период времени существует очень серьезная неопределенность о том, как рынок может воспринимать этот продукт, этот прототип, и существуют большие риски. В, это, вот в этот момент, период развития компании, практически недоступны стартап-компаниям ни кредиты банковские, ни другие виды финансирования. И один из, может быть, даже единственный источник финансирования в этот момент – это венчурный капитал. Именно поэтому мы в том числе говорим о серьезной роли венчурного капитала в развитии инноваций. Что касается трудовых ресурсов, как мы понимаем, самый дорогой ресурс в экономике знаний, в новой экономике знаний, в сервисной экономике – это человеческий ресурс. Компании тратят на него все больше и больше средств. И есть такой очень интересный пример, приведенный Европейским инновационным фондом. После первого раунда инвестиций, венчурных инвестиций в стартап-компании, количество рабочих мест возрастает в этих компаниях на 37%. Это только первый раунд инвестиций. И, и действительно это так, это известный факт. В первую очередь, когда 
стартап-компании получают венчурные инвестиции, они начинают развивать, развивать компании, нанимая все больше разработчиков, да, экспертов, которые нужны для развития того или иного продукта. Вот на примере ЕС в течение пяти лет венчурные компании Европейского Союза создают примерно 1 миллион рабочих мест. Скажу сразу, что эта цифра сопоставима с Соединенными Штатами, там чуть-чуть больше, но не больше 2 миллионов, то есть примерно такие же цифры. И, и рост количества рабочих мест в венчурных компаниях происходит в несколько раз быстрее, чем в остальной экономике. Вот пример Соединенных Штатов Америки. Вы видите название семи крупных технологических компаний США. Это Microsoft, Cisco, Dell, Oracle, другие. Вот эти, всего семь компаний за 20 лет создали 250 тысяч рабочих мест в Соединенных Штатах. Экономический рост тоже очень важный показатель. Венчурные инвестиции, рост венчурных инвестиций всего на один процентный пункт от ВВП дает прирост реального ВВП, ВВП на три процентных пункта. Можно сделать вывод о том, что рост венчурных инвестиций является страны с высокой венчурной активностью, с высокими с высоким уровнем и объемами венчурных инвестиций, обычно это страны с высоким экономическим ростом. Обратное не, не всегда правда. То есть это не значит, что, например, все страны с высоким экономическим ростом в то же время имеют развитые венчурные экосистемы. То есть экономический рост может, быть, может иметь и другие источники, безусловно. Но мне кажется, что это тоже очень показательные цифры для, для белорусской экономики, для, когда мы только начинаем развивать, делаем первые шаги в развитии венчурных инвестиций. Но еще важная компания. Если вы помните, я говорила в самом начале о том, что важная цифра. Я говорила о том, что только 2% новых компаний США, Две десятых процента новых компаний США получают венчурные инвестиции. И при этом аж целых 18 процентов среди публичных компаний, то есть это компании, которые вышли на IPO, это компании с венчурными инвестициями. О чем это говорит? Это говорит о том, что э, эти компании очень эффективны. Посмотрите, э, вот эти небольшие, скажем, 18 процентов, имеют рыночную капитализацию в 4 триллиона долларов и, что очень важно тоже, на мой взгляд, тратят на исследование больше четверти всех расходов государственных, академических, частных расходов на исследование в Соединенных Штатах Америки. Всего 18 компаний, 18 процентов публичных компаний США. Естественно, в них есть венчурные инвестиции. В них занято 4 миллиона человек. Недавно было проведено исследование, буквально в 2015 году, как раз исследование публичных компаний США с участием венчурного капитала. Авторы сделали, на мой взгляд, очень важный вывод. Несмотря на то, что венчурный капитал, объемы инвестиций, количество сделок – Несколько раз меньше, чем объемы, например, прямых инвестиций, количество сделок прямых инвестиций. Этот тип финансирования гораздо более эффективен, потому что с участием венчурного капитала создаются самые успешные, самые крупные компании мира. Если посмотреть на опыт США, три из пяти самых крупных, да, в принципе, это, наверное, и самые крупные компании мировые, да, три из пяти самых крупных компаний мира, это Apple, Google и Microsoft, созданы с участием э, венчурного капитала. Ну и, может быть, опыт, который даже чуть более релевантен для нас на той стадии вот, э, развития, которая находится в Беларуси сегодня, э, в, вы знаете, что венчурный капитал стал развиваться в середине прошлого века в Соединенных Штатах Америки. И вот ближе к 70-м годам, после того, как был принят государственный акт, о том, который разрешал пенсионным фондам э, вкладывать деньги в венчурные фонды, 
то есть быть так, так называемыми LP, да, инвесторами в инвестиционных фондах. И сразу после этого акта в десятки раз увеличилась капитализация венчурных фондов, то есть сразу миллиарды долларов стали тратиться на венчурные инвестиции, и начался, собственно, расцвет венчурного капитала, эры венчурного капитала в Соединенных Штатах Америки. Так вот, этот период, очень активный период, 30 лет, Посмотрите, за этот период было инвестировано 270, больше 270 миллиардов долларов США в американские компании, создано более 7 миллионов рабочих мест. И эти компании, конечно, оправдали да, эти вложения, посмотрите, потому что они принесли более триллиона долларов дохода. Ну и да, это большая цифра, они генерируют более 13% ВВП США. Мне кажется, что эти цифры сами по себе очень убедительны. И если мы в нашем государстве будем делать нужные шаги для того, чтобы появилось место для развития венчурной индустрии, наша экономика от этого только будет выигрывать. Ну и, конечно, мне очень приятно, что сегодня мы сможем услышать не только опыт вот мировой, но и опыт конкретной страны, Финляндии, в том, как Финляндия развивала и развивает венчурные инвестиции, как она смогла добиться таких потрясающих результатов. Вы услышите сегодня о них, вы услышите также, Уилл, наверное, расскажет и, и, и об экономическом эффекте венчурных инвестиций на экономику Финляндии. Я хочу пригласить на сцену Уилла Кардуэлла. Уилл Кардуэлл. Like to talk, uh, with microphone or, That's or, fine. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this works? Yeah. Okay. Wow, nice to see everybody here. Thanks for coming. Hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> um, so my name's Will, and I've been here now for a couple days. Uh, And my role here is trying to bridge in some ideas from international uh, ecosystems for uh, Belarus to learn from. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, Finland's venture capital ecosystem. And I want to do a combination of kind of statistics and giving you some idea how it's, where it's come from and where it's going. At the same time, I want to show you a little bit of inspiration too because uh, things can happen very fast and there's some small things that happened over the years that made a huge impact and without those small things all the big initiatives really wouldn't have worked as well as they have. Okay, so first my, uh, it's always hard to explain my background but uh, maybe in this context uh, I've been part of investment funds and a private investor for about 20 years, uh, mostly in Finland but I've been also investing in Lithuania and also the United States. Um, I'm originally from the United States, from Virginia, uh, and spent most of my time in North Carolina. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina's Business School. But maybe here's a, just a, a way to describe it a little bit better. Um, so since 1990, let's see, does this, this part work? Maybe that's risky. Um, but basically I've been either in academics or investing or running companies for about 25 years. Um, I moved to Finland in 1996, so I've been now in Europe for 21 years. Um, and I've seen this whole issue of how to build ecosystems from all the different angles. So I've been an entrepreneur, been an investor, been a researcher, a teacher, and I feel like I've uh, learned a lot in that, in that period. I'll also add maybe a, uh, a little bit about Finland. It's a remarkable country in a lot of ways, but we have huge, huge challenges today there. Uh, back in 2008, so where was I? I was somewhere between the university and my company, Valimo. Um, Apple introduced the iPhone, and basically with that innovation, first destroyed uh, Nokia's mobile phone unit, which was based by far the biggest employer in Finland. 
So it took about five or six years for it to die, but basically from there, employment went straight down. Second thing, it led the way towards uh, the iPad, which actually destroyed the paper business in Finland, funny enough. We have a, there's a funny uh, quote uh, from our prime minister at the time that basically Steve Jobs destroyed two huge industries in Finland with basically one small innovation. Uh, there's a long story behind that, uh, which I won't go into, but those two, uh, those two together with the decline in uh, Finland-Russian trade really hit Finland so hard, and it's still recovering, frankly. So the agenda here is I want to first argue why I think Finland's uh, success story in building an venture capital and uh, angel investing and startup ecosystem is really a valid model for a place like Belarusia. Um, so given that's true, how was it done? What were the key kind of elements of it? Um, show you some success stories. Um, look at the current status and the outlook for the future and uh, fi finish up with just a few thoughts about what uh, Belarusia can learn. But, but first, a couple pieces of inspiration. So really, the kickstart to our whole uh, ecosystem was driven by these two guys. Um, the guy on the left was about 22, 23 at that time, halfway through his studies, not sure really what he wanted, business school student. He led a delegation uh, of, of young students from Finland uh, to MIT in Boston. And so the guy on the right is maybe not a household name yet. Uh, actually, he's becoming a household name. His name is Bengt Holmstrom. And he's a no he won the Nobel Prize for Economics this year. Finn, a Finn who's a professor at MIT, but also on the board of our university. And, and Bengt convinced uh, Christo the, to really dig in and look into what's not working in the Finnish uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Why are there not enough entrepreneurs? Why are they not growing fast enough? And to really try to build a student movement. So it's quite interesting, a very young and a not so young guy kind of together, kind of side by side to make, make change happen. So I always like to keep that in mind because the changes in a society and ecosystem, it's driven by unforeseen events, by people that you might not be able to predict. So our ecosystems have to allow those people to thrive. So next I want to show a short video. This is a, well, this just shows you kind of where we are today and I'll give some background to that in a moment. But can you show the video? Do I have to press a button? Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. See how it works. Okay. I'm an investor, but I still have dreams. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And not ever be satisfied. Extra two hundred fifty million dollars. Daring to go where markets are. The world is way bigger than the World Wide Web. Actually, one of the biggest tech IPOs that Europe has seen for decades. This dreaming of robotics and virtual reality and driverless cars. This whole phenomena is going to be huge. This seems to be the center of the universe um, in terms of technology right now. And just showing the, the strong network that's, that's been established here, it's, it's breathtaking. It's something people have to see. You can't really deny the power of this whole region in terms of the tech world. Because there's a unity around purpose and on what we are doing here. Instead of me traveling all around Europe and US to meet them, different investors, they are here. We're here to meet entrepreneurs and angels and fellow investors and understand sort of what's going to be big. I mean, I've never been to a conference like this before. One of the hidden jewels of our of planet Earth. I don't know how you pull it off. I, I think it's like the best uh, startup event you can find in Europe or in the world. tell you how impressed I am by this event. This is my first time in Slash, but definitely not the last one. I would say get your ass to Slash is what I would say. It's fantastic. 
Okay. A little bit of hype, but uh, the, the point here is that this is where we are today. That was for 2016 slush. Actually, I think 40 people, 17 teams came from uh, Belarus to, uh, I guess by bus, to, to Helsinki. And then there were about 20,000 people. This was maybe a 100-person conference back in 2009, so it was basically a non you know, a non-factor. There was, it was, you know, some interesting stuff. About the same number of people in this room, or, or, or you know, maybe a little bit more, but not much more. And now it's uh, 20,000, I think 22,000 people last year. And um, it was driven by our student movement at our university. There are 50, the one guy says here, he doesn't understand how we pull this off. We pull it off with 1,500 volunteers uh, working 24-7 for a long term to make it happen. But anyway, that's, that was a far cry from where we were earlier. So let me start with uh, Finland is a uh, success story in ben, ben, building a venture capital and angel ecosystem. So here's a, a, a chart. There are two statistical sources I'm going to use. First is the Fen Finnish Venture Capital Association, which was founded in 2000, 1999, 2000 by an organization called Citra, which is a national organization in Finland but it serves as an industry group for venture capital industry. So what this shows, the, the takeaway here is it, within Europe, last year, or this was 2015, Finland had the highest per capita amount of venture investment uh, in Europe. And in fact, over the years 2007 to 2015, it was second highest to Sweden which had a few huge uh, Spotify and a few others that have gotten hundreds and hundreds of millions. So Finland has built it up with relatively small investments, but many, many investments. Sweden has built it with quite large investments, but fewer number. So I think that shows that this is, um, we're a viable uh, ecosystem. Just showing kind of how it works. So this diagram shows institutional investors. I think uh, Tanya said a little bit about the structure of venture capital, but these are basically, we'll see pension funds, insurance companies, government agencies investing into Finnish private equity firms or actually venture capital firms in this case. Uh, of the money th there for 2015, 13 million of it, of that money went outside of Finland. So these are Finnish venture capital firms investing in non-Finnish companies, but 101 million uh, of, of the capital went in to Finnish companies. And you can see that together with that, 21 million of foreign venture capital came in. So a couple things to learn from a policy standpoint. Yes, some of the, there's agency, government agency money coming into venture firms, some goes out, but you'll see that the number coming in is bigger. So the net of this is 8 million positive into the ecosystem. There's several things, that's a positive thing, we get more money, but from here, the private equity and, and, and venture capital firms learn something, uh, how other venture firms do it, but also bring in international money uh, and learn there. So that's, uh, that's kind of the structure of the, of, of the environment today. Another, looking over time, so back in 1996, we had about 50 million euros. Um, and this is looking at the stage distribution of the investment. So we have seed stage, which is the very earliest or almost earliest, startup phase, which is a little bit more developed companies. Later stage is when they already have customers and revenue incoming, so they're growing. And then, and then uh, I guess the the line is the number of investments. So this is volume, euro volume, this is number. And the things to see here, first of all, huge hype curve around uh, the, the so-called internet bubble, um, which burst, by the way, and you can see it coming back down. Um, but you can see here, I'd like to, to focus a little bit on the bottom and the second, the, the first two segments. So. Back in 1996, only two million of really seed stage capital going in. Um, uh, and then eight million of startups, so very early. So as it's grown now, it's, it's obviously really peaked here, went way down, but has really stabilized around 200 to 250 million of, of venture money coming in every year. And Actually, one satisfying curve is really, except for this outlier year, 
you know, we're at a record highs of this startup phase. So seeds, you know, 10 million of seed money, that's ten, uh, five times as much as we had in 1996. But uh, this 66 is almost 10 times as much. So it's really grown. And I'll talk a little bit about the drivers there, but the, the key is, I mentioned this organization called Citra, which is a publicly funded entity that, uh, that enabled the networking of investors uh, and also created itself a few venture funds that it spun out to be private around here. So those, in those f venture funds that were spun out here and the fund managers, I was one of them actually, are, are all, almost all very active here. So this really, what was going on back here in terms of training and, and networking our ecosystem really pays off uh, going forward because we've been able to work with younger people to bring them up into the system. And I'll show you a bit more where we stand today. Last one, so, of, of this section is uh, new funds raised by finished private equity fir firms. You'll see the, the lion's share, uh, and this goes back to 96, but goes forward today. Um, uh, lion's share has always been pension funds uh, in, in this kind of green, but government agencies have been important, uh, stimulating uh, the system over the years. Um, and again, you have to think about this, this is government agency money being invested alongside private investors uh, to invest into startup companies. So you can see the agencies are, are important, but you can't really do anything without some private uh, support for it. And then there are a lot of other important players in terms of providing the capital. So impact of venture capital at this point, what we can see, this was a study done in 2012, and I would argue it's you know, only gotten stronger now. So um, venture capital uh, investors, sales growth, uh, uh, companies that are backed by venture capital firms grown by, grow by nine percentage points faster than average uh, company in the same industry. Uh, employment growth is twice as fast among uh, venture-backed companies. Um, added value, you know, I'm not sure exactly how that calculation worked, but, you know, basically economic value add is, is, is six percentage points faster. So all these show that basically venture-backed companies grow faster. Um, uh, and then, importantly, you know, the capital is something, but the expertise is equally important. Um, VC investment uh, in, uh, increases portfolio companies' exports, um, uh, increases their capital intensity, uh, R&D intensity, and then the board members, uh, the boards of directors of the companies grow, uh, become more international more quickly than others. And for small countries like Belarus and Finland, you, you know, the markets are global. Um, they may be east, they may be west, but certainly you know, our local markets can't support high growth uh, entrepreneurship. We have to get the companies global. I'll say a, just a small word, that I just keep saying VCPE, PE is private equity, which is later, even later stage uh, venture money. So these, this money goes in quite late when the companies are already very profitable and this is more or less working capital for capital equipment, things like that. Whereas venture capital is kind of the earlier stages. Uh, but they look at it together because the, um, the, uh, uh, the statistics come in together. But anyway, so from here I, I gather that uh, venture-backed companies grow on, fa on, on average much faster than regular ones. And I, I, I welcome questions uh, at, at the end. So how about business angels? So that's another segment of early stage investors. We have a group called a network called FIBON, or Finnish Business Angels Network. It's said at the bottom it's part of uh, European Business Angel Network. And in fact, it was voted amongst Europeans 2012 and 2014, the kind of business angel networks of the year, So, which means that they're doing something right, in my opinion. Um, but as you can see, 100 events annually, over 500 approved members, which means people that are actually looking to invest in early stage companies. So I'll show you a little bit of the uh, kind of uh, statistics behind there. So going back to 2010, this is kind of the, from their view, from the uh, uh, business angel view, you'll see um, business angels here were quite small. I don't know if that was, 
uh, already not, I, I guess there was a little bit of other, but two million in, uh, in 2010, up to 37 million today. So uh, increased by 15 fold over 10 years. Uh, went way forward. Um, so there, there's been a lot of growth and importantly, I'll make a point at the end, the, the fact that there is an industry group that's tracking statistics, that's getting people together is fundamental to that success. Because many of these, well, we'll show, show in a moment the, um, the types of uh, people that become business angels, but it's converting accumulated capital that may come from heavy industry, forestry, whatever in Finland, into kind of investment capital for small companies. So very important to have an angel network. As, as I know, there's one started here. Looking last year, um, kind of 37 million capital invested. There's a couple of sources. This is not really, really important, but the median uh, individual made, uh, in, investor invested about uh, 20,000 euros during 2015. So these are not massive investments. They're, 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 they're significant, and, and more importantly, as is, 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 is actually this shows, a lot of times getting this business angel money in is what ensures that you get this other money in. So without these guys, a lot of this extra, the venture capital and other money, both coming from Finnish investors and foreigns, doesn't happen, so they're, they're critical. Um, yeah, their median stake in startups is quite small, 2%, so it's not like these angels are taking majority stakes in companies. They're taking very small stakes, but doing some specific things we'll see in a minute. 322 companies received financing in 2015 from angels, so that's it's a big number. In Finland, population of 5.5 million, significant number. Um, and then this is just a, a, a Pitch Finland is a monthly event, so uh, every month 8 to 10 companies present and about 33% of the companies that are presenting get funded. So the point here is these, these companies that present are analyzed by FIBON and selected to, to, to present. So they're highly kind of already screened. So they, that's an important purpose that, that FIBON uh, serves. Uh, right, so yeah, so the median angel if you look at his whole portfolio, his or her whole portfolio is around 200,000 euros. So as we see, the median investment in a year is about 20,000, but they do that, you could look at this on average for 10 years, so they're every year doing 20,000, so adding up to 200,000 on average. Um, lead investor, very important concept. So these people act as, in 36% in of the cases, as the discoverer of the company and uh, do the work to analyze the company for the, venture, uh, for the venture firms or the syndicates it's done. So in this case, it's very, they're very important. You can argue that without the business angels, none of this, these deals, one third of the deals would not happen. Um, about a, roughly half and half, a little less than half invest as private individuals, a little more than half invest as a, companies, uh, as a company. Um, at, kind of done both and there's, you know, there may be tax reasons and others that you may choose to do one or the other. Today, probably more and more uh, individual angels are setting up private investment companies and putting their own money there and investing through the company rather than straight as an individual. Where they invest, 9% of it goes to seed, 28% to start up early stage, very early, early growth. So again, some revenues coming in, but maybe not profitable. And then growth is where there's actually profitable and they're investing in the, you know, uh, increasing the scale of the company. Um, and then, you know, of the angels, about 22% call themselves full-time angels. 45% is a, a part-time and 33% is a hobby. It's an expensive hobby, uh, potentially. But, um, but these are, but all, all can pay, play important roles. This guy, these people are very, very active. Is they probably have a, a, a title in the company as a you know, senior manager. Um, these are less active, but maybe board members or regular advisors, and these tend to be quite passive. But you know, there's a, having a combination is, is, is good. Industries where they invest, it's kind of all over the place. You can see the 
euro, the, let's say this is the number of investments, 26% go into ICT or IT, and about 29% of the money. Um, but there's some other important sectors, in particular environment and clean tech has been, been a, an important place for those people to be investing. All right, so in my mind, there are two keys to the success of both uh, of the whole industry, meaning early stage investments uh, through venture funds and angels. One is very good local organization where they, they invested in building a team to actually collect the statistics and run the events. So one for angels, one for venture capitalists, and then these two connect quite a bit. And then the other one, the global reach is, Early on, we took a platform called Gust. There are five or six of these um, kind of online platforms where you can publish your deals to global investors. And uh, Gust is the one we use, and it's, uh, it, it really helps, you know, the, the startups actually upload their pitches and some information about themselves. And it becomes easy for me as an angel to promote that company to an investor in San Francisco or London or China or whatever. I just send them a link to, to their profile here. And uh, I, I think that's a very important dynamic now in investing. It used to be that we would not have a hope of having a company in Minsk or a company of Helsinki get an investor from Silicon Valley. Now, it's, very, it's been democratized in the sense that, that that smartest money around the world is looking for the best ideas and the best people. And there's no reason that they, you know, if, if, if there's an, uh, somebody doing something better in Minsk than they're doing it in Silicon Valley, the money will come here. And uh, I would argue that's in general a good thing. And obviously you've had cases, Masquerade and, and, and others already, Viber, that have really taken off globally. And I, there's no reason there can't be more of that. So I would say these are two kind of key learnings. I'll show some others later. Um, two key government organizations. So Citra uh, is, is kind of, the, the contrast here, I would argue Citra is a breeder of new ideas. It's kind of a think tank that makes seed investments in industries, new industries, health-related, environment, whatever. They, they've, they've kind of seeded um, research programs, and then kind of seed investment programs in, in, in critical industries for the country. Funny enough, one of the first critical industries that they backed was venture capital, because that, as I showed back in 1996, there was no industry effectively. And uh, Citra decided back then that, uh, that we needed it, and they did a special program to really kickstart it by creating Finnish Venture Capital Association by spinning out some of their own funds to private managers. Uh, so they've been critical to starting the industry and kind of keeping it going, but they've also seeded other things. So they're more of a think tank. DECAS is a, um, is a publicly funded uh, financing research organization. So they focus not so much on the really early stage things, but now when an industry starts growing, Companies can go there and take some grants, and I'll show you how that works in a minute. But these two really, I would argue, are probably good policy coming from them has really helped uh, Finland break out from where it was. A, couple's, a couple, I would go back to this chart, chart that I showed earlier, but just to demonstrate the point. So, like I said, the industry, the venture industry was nothing here, and this is really where Citra did a kind of a five-year plan to build the industry up. And interestingly enough, I published a book uh, in 1998 uh, for Citra that compared Finland and Israel's uh, venture capital community. And that learning from Israel from several other countries has really been the driver for, you know, a success story here going forward. But Citra was the one who kind of catalyzed all that. Tekes does things differently. So they primarily put the money straight to the companies, and they give grants and loans. And this is a busy slide, so I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on it, but um, one of the points here is that the top of the curves are basically R&D loans, R&D grants, and NIY is the Young Innovative Company Program, which is basically a combination of grants and loans. These tend to go to a, a bit more 
developed companies, so they usually have, have some products and customers, so they'll give grants to uh, the firms to develop on top of things they already have. Whereas the NIY program, which was just started, well, when was it started? It started in 2008. Um, but that's become an important tool for very young startups to get large grants if they can demonstrate that they have big markets. And um, so what happens here is, again, the reason that seed and venture capital and business angels are all in the picture is because Decas will not give a dime to you know, a family company with no outside capital because the general, you know, the average small business is not really geared up to growth. They're geared, geared towards paying their own salaries, supporting their family for the future. That's all fine, but they shouldn't have government uh, funding in, in Finland's opinion. But these are companies that have stated they want to grow, they want to internationalize, they want to hire more people, they want to pay more taxes, want to do more exports, all the positive things for the economy. And so Teches will say, okay, the grants tend to be anywhere from a few tens of thousands to even a million euros or more. If the company, if a company can demonstrate that they've brought in some private capital, then Teches will put money on top of that. And from an investor's perspective, it's beautiful because I, I, I invest into the company, I take shares out, and then they get an external source of capital that's not taking more shares from me. It's, it's not diluting my ownership. It's only giving more capital for growth to the company. So I think this has been a good thing. If you think about what doesn't show here and what's actually becoming increasingly important is EU tools like Horizon 2020 and others. So you can kind of think about those as well as being potential sources of external capital. And I know that that's eligible in, um, in Belarus as well. But that kind of shows Tekis' value that, you know, if this much money is coming in from private investors, it's leveraged with uh, that much more. And Tekis' goal is not to earn profits on these, on these investments. Oops, sorry. Uh, it's, to, it's to basically attract more capital um, and to create jobs, more or less. So this, the, the, that's the tool of the Ministry of Economy to create, create jobs in the, in the innovative sector. All right, so I hope I kind of demonstrated there, you know, government and private, I mean, it doesn't always work perfectly smoothly all the time, but there really is a common goal and they've really supported each other to build the ecosystem. <clears throat> so a, a few things that have happened that I, I, I think these are kind of the big picture of what policymakers can do. I want to emphasize kind of a, a number of the things that have happened over the years that have really made a difference to kind of accelerate the, the growth of the ecosystem. And I'll show a few, a, a few small case studies. I won't show all of these, but um, some of these maybe you recognize, but I'll tell, you know, that by far our biggest uh, sector that's been exploding has been the gaming sector largely because of Rovio and Angry Birds. There are also, I put Alto University in the middle here because really almost all of these, actually all of these movements and companies were, were generated out of this, this university. Um, it's not the only success stories in Finland, so I'm a bit biased because I've been part of this group, but each city and town has a bit of the same story. Um, Rovio really kind of showed the way. Supercell, I'll, I'll have a little Case study, Arctic Startup was very important. It was a media company that started covering and lifting up the startup industry so people could get up and read about what happens in the, in the startup community. Really big and kind of important to get people focused on it. I'm gonna show something here. I already showed Slush, but Slush again was a, basically a small conference started by one of the key guys at, at, at Rovio, uh, Peter Westerbacher. And again, he, he had a hundred, couple hundred people max by 2010. And he got, when he got hired at Rovio, he decided he couldn't continue doing this all himself. So he turned it over to our students who were in this Alto ES, this Alto Entrepreneurship Society. So they took over the conference and basically students grew it from a couple hundred people to 20,000, 100 times in, 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 ten, in ten, less than 10 years generating 
easily many millions for the economy, but probably even more. Uh, okay, and I'm going to talk, this day for failure is a funny thing I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So actually, I'll talk about it right now. If you could show this, um, so this explains itself, but I'll explain a little bit more about it afterwards. Finland, we started the first day for failure. With a single idea in mind. That we would change. Change, change our culture around failure. The way people talk about it. The way people feel about it. And understand failure as a learning experience. We thought the first step to make our vision reality was to ask people to tell about their failures and the lessons they learned. And they did. Suomalainen asennehan on aina se, että epäonnistuminen on tosi iso juttu ja sitä hävetään. Ja se myös vaikuttaa siihen, että ihmiset ei lähde yrittämään. Ihmiset ei edes aloita asioita sen takia, että pelkää epäonnistuvansa. Se on ehkä se pahin, että muut katsoo mua eri tavalla. Se oli musta niin hirveän paskaa ja mä olin niin huono, että mä olin jo valmis heittää handut tiskiin. Mun mielestä me ollaan liian paljon pelätään virheitä ihan kaikessa, mitä me tehdään, kun nehän on just se kehityksen paikka. Koska jos ei tule floppia, ei myöskään tule hittejä. Et mulla on vähän sellainen sanonta, että jos ei ole koskaan kipeä, niin ei tiedä, miltä tuntuu olla terve. Aina ei voi voittaa, mutta et melkein aina. This year is no different, just bigger and bolder. Join us on the 13th of October and celebrate the day for failure with us by organizing a workshop or an event in your local area. Check out our website dayforfailure.com to find out more on how to get involved. And remember, if you've never failed, you've never tried anything new. So this is there's a lot of ironies here, but this this was started also by our students around the same time they were taking over Slush in 2011. Now I think it's 70 countries are organizing days for failure. So it's been a huge kind of, it's, it's, you know, there are many press articles on it. And one of the early, we had our prime minister, president, uh, the chairman of Nokia, I mean, all the kind of key people in the country doing small speeches about real errors that they made and what the impact was and what they learned from it. And I think, again, the different, the different thing about being a, a, adopting an innovative culture is that you have to accept that if you do everything right, still things cannot, it, it may not take off. And you have to learn from that or you'll never get anywhere. So again, the students taking this and, and being frustrated by the fact that they weren't allowed to make any, once they made a mistake, it was kind of game over. But now it's, it, it's turned more, a, a bit more of the Silicon Valley cost, co culture. I'm, Myself, I'm, uh, Silicon Valley is an amazing place. There all, there's a lot of things we can learn from it, but we can't take everything into our local economies. That's one thing I learned uh, uh, over the last 10 years. So you try to learn from it and adopt it, adapt it. But one of the key things is the ability to uh, learn from failure and restart. And so I think that's something that we've really learned. Another fantastic growth story um, I mentioned this group, so this was, uh, how, so the problem was that young women were not uh, joining, uh, not becoming mathematicians, scientists, whatever. Um, so there's this girl, Linda Lilkus, who started a small a, a movement called Rails Girls, which was again in our university, I, I actually was running the entrepreneurship center at the time, gave her, uh, she took maybe a few hundred euro uh, grant did a small set of, um, of materials to teach uh, basically high school girls coding. Uh, that led, that kind of initial thing led to where I believe it's again 50 or 60 countries that have, have uh, uh, Rails girls as one of their um, kind of key elements to uh, teaching coding to young people, which again is fundamental in modern society. But that wasn't all because she did this all as a kind of a, altruistic or as a, as a philanthropic activity. She didn't get paid anything, but she realized that um, she might have some talent in, uh, in writing and uh, drawing. So she went on Kickstarter and attempted to raise $10,000 to publish a book called Hello Ruby. And she raised $380,000 in less than a month. 
So 38 times as much money as she was targeting, which totally, of course, now she's a global superstar speaking all over the, all the, the world. She's one of the EU kind of leading digital advocates uh, and, and just a fantastic person. Uh, I won't show the video, but her, I, I think the, the video is probably the best I've ever seen for a crowdfunding campaign, and it really shows what can be done. Uh, again, starting from very small means. This uh, is great. So Ilka Bonanen is a serial entrepreneur. He started a couple companies, did very well with them, started Supercell back in 2010, 2011, and to make a long story short, it became Finland's or Europe's first so-called decacorn. So in less than five years, the company was sold for $10 billion, which is, you know, mind-boggling. Uh, but what's even more mind-boggling is the incredibly um, hum humility of this guy that uh, uh, he was quoted in Wall Street Journal or something like that saying that he's actually the world's least powerful CEO because he lets, he's got a culture there of teamwork that enables the best uh, projects to come up. Um, so that's been tremendously important for Finland for role model for one thing, but also for capital into the system. Because what happened is all this money, so yes, the company got bought first by a Japanese company, actually, and then by a Chinese company, actually ended up buying the whole thing. Um, but the, the, the local entrepreneurs, investors that made the money on this have plowed that money back into the economy. So it, it's, this, this money gets recycled so quickly when there's success story. I mean, he literally became a billionaire, a fairly normal guy. And his, his not only he's built a venture, venture funds, he's been, built foundations, uh, a lot of nonprofit work together with very active personal and, and fund investing. So again, it's a great, uh, it, you know, it couldn't have ever happened to a better person in our society, the, the perfect person to succeed. So current status and outlook for the future. Um, so this is an ugly slide, but this kind of shows the, uh, the main investors in, in Finland, investing in Finnish companies. Uh, and I won't go through the differences, but what I will say is, uh, so we have state-backed um, funds. So about four funds that have um, from five to 10 million euros of their capital is coming from Tekas. So as I showed that organization, they put money to the funds together with private companies. And these guys have built fund sizes of 20 to 30 million euro. Um, another one is so-called Vigos. That was an accelerator program. So it was again sponsored by Tekas. Uh, and all these kind of grayish or brownish ones started off uh, as kind of at least supported by the government. And actually these guys as well, which were the supercell investors, started uh, under the kind of government program. Uh, there's some crowdfunding uh, uh, groups. And uh, then over here it's the international investors that because of slush and other things have become very, very active in... Uh, in Finland, meaning they do um, an investment or two every year on average amongst those guys. So it's actually now grown from, if I showed this slide as, as it was in 1996, it was maybe a couple names. If I showed it in 2008, there was probably, you know, maybe eight to 10 active names. And now we have, I think there are 35 or so here. So that's, that's one way to look at it. If you look at it as logos, which everybody wants to, these are kind of the earlier investors to later. Most of these are putting all, uh, some or all of, most of their capital in Finland, but some of them are investing internationally as well as they succeed. And uh, so it's a very active uh, environment. So I tried to think of a few lessons that I could highlight, and there's, there's, there's a lot of different things, but maybe the, if, I, if I take the top ones, um, really long-term vision in building the ecosystem, but taking fast measure, measurable actions by the public sector. So yes, the, I, we know building an, uh, you know, a venture community, bringing capital in, it takes many years potentially. You can see they started in 1996 and now 2017. Well, probably we could have said it was really one of the top 
uh, uh, investing communities probably by 2012 or 2013, so it took 17 years maybe, 15 to 17 years. However, a lot of things happened quickly, so we could already see learning and uh, improvement in the kind of uh, conditions for entrepreneurs having more capital very on. So long-term vision, short measurable actions, and then based on these actions, adjust the long-term, but don't get scared when things don't happen fast enough, I guess, because outside, outside um, factors will either speed up or slow down progression. Uh, so you have to have a long-term vision. Um, back very young people, but old too, so we have, you know, as you can see, a lot of effort on young people coming in. They're fundamental to everything. But funny enough, as the young people came in, the older people also came in. So there was a great kind of trend as, as Nokia started, you know, coming down the, t the mobile phone group. Many of those people started new companies they brought in our students that had all the energy. So you had the know-how and experience from Nokia, but the, the energy from the youth, the great dynamic. And there was strong backing from the public sector on those dynamics. Um, support capacity building in both entrepreneurial talent and capital investing. It's, it's you know, if you, ha you can't really have one develop without the other. I mean, this may develop without a lot of capital, and, and I, I always advise against having too much capital, but it will happen a lot faster if you have a smart, well-informed, uh, knowledgeable investor community, even if they're doing very small investments. I mean, it's not so much, it's not so much about the size of investments from the, from, at least from the angel community. It's really about their engagement and, and making a lot of, you know, getting involved with a lot of companies. Uh, but very important to support both. Uh, and then fail the failure is, a, is the hardest one, and it's super hard in Finland, and it's probably hard here in, in, in most, most places. I come from a place that, I mean, in the United States, literally, you, you almost assume you're going to fail several times before you get to where, where you know, your, your final destination. But I, I think very few economies look, look at it that way. And finding ways to get people to feel more um, comfortable sharing their, their failures because that's actually where you learn how to do things right. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, there's so many examples, I won't start to go into them, but you, you, in investing in entrepreneurship, the learning curve is very, very fast. So as soon as you start doing things, you start learning what works and what doesn't and then kind of firming up your strategy. But if you, if you expect people to make a huge success the first time, it simply doesn't happen. The world's too competitive uh, and too unpredictable to, to, to you know, assume that just because you do the right things all the time that they're all going to be hits. So those are maybe four high-level takeaways that uh, I've seen over the last 20 years. By the way, I've been very active also in Lithuania and, um, and to a certain extent other Baltic states and, and, and Eastern Russia, St. Petersburg. So I have a fairly good view of what's happening across the, uh, those economies. And I feel that people are, you know, the, the trends that I talk about here are relevant for all of those and certainly relevant for you guys from what I've seen so far. So that's my talk. Thanks. Дорогие друзья, давайте перейдем к такой сессии вопросов и ответов. Очень хочется, мне кажется, у Вилла была очень обстоятельная, такая интересная презентация, которая, ну, по крайней мере, у меня, как минимум, вызывала много вопросов по ходу, и думаю, что у вас тоже. Вилл, would you like to sit? Or, yeah, пожалуйста, да. У нас будет микрофон для, нет, для участников или мне как лучше? Давайте, может быть, я вам дам свой микрофон. Спасибо, Валентин Лопан, агентство деловых связей. Я попрошу переводчика, да, потому что я, наверное, стесняюсь своего английского. Yeah, my Russian and, and is bad, and my Belarusian is even worse. Да, я. 
Does that have <laughs> translation in it? Or? Окей, okay, да. Валентин Лопан, агентство деловых связей. Uh, Вилл, вопрос такой у меня. Uh, вот Финляндия – это страна, ну, скажем так, с устоявшимися институтами рыночной экономики, uh, и поэтому какое-то венчурное финансирование выглядит достаточно естественно на каком-то этапе. А что вы можете сказать о возможностях развития такого инвестирования в странах, где uh, такие институты еще не сформировались или не устоялись, например, как в Беларуси, где, в общем-то, отсутствуют пенсионные фонды, где понятие предпринимательского риска еще недостаточно обдумано и сформировано, где правовые условия тоже не всегда ясны. Вот в этих стартовых условиях надо очень далеко смотреть или все-таки что-то можно делать в ближайшие, ближайшие годы? Спасибо. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, good question. <laughs> so, what I would I would advise is two things. First of all, you have to do something. So, standing still is not not the answer, uh, as you as you note. Um, so, I think you can look to other places that maybe have been in the situation. Uh, Obviously, Estonia is often highlighted as being very fast change. I see Lithuania changing fast. Um, so you can kind of look at how they bridge the kind of older mentality to the new. Um, uh, the other thing is, is, is getting, you know, getting the laws right is important. So getting some sort of kind of control on the ownership and intellectual property, who owns what. It's, It's a challenge, but it needs to be done. Um, and and I think I think the other thing maybe is from a mentality standpoint, change can happen a lot faster now than it's happened in the past. And 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 I think embracing the idea that okay, maybe it took Finland from '96 to 2017 to really do all that I showed. Um, You know, in the current age, that can happen faster. And Finland, of course, had a heavily socialist background. So it, we didn't have all the laws and the um, kind of uh, the DNA to do this uh, back in the 90s. But it, but it happened fast. So I, I, I advise to look for models and then to find the small things you can do quickly. Because one thing is for sure, I mean, is masquerade or can show I mean you know the entrepreneurship can come quickly the the supporting mechanisms are always running fast to try to catch up with the entrepreneurs so my best advice to cap but to public sector is to come uh, to learn from the entrepreneurs and try to support them I think and actually that's part of our program here over the next you know few years to try to support that and I, I fully identify with your point there because you know you just can't as I said you can't take Silicon Valley and move it here but we can take bits and pieces and try to improve it. Спасибо большое. Коллеги, еще вопросы, может быть? Mm -hmm. uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Will, for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, we also know that Finland is a global leader in sustainability field, uh, in sustainable in, uh, investment, impact investment, uh, triple bottom line. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask your opinion on that, how it could work here maybe, mm -hmm. what works, uh, mm -hmm. and how uh, finance could uh, circulate through these kinds yeah. of models. Thank you. It's a, great, it's a great point. So Finland has been a leader in that and it's been willing to invest in that over the years. As I showed, it's interesting that it's actually one of the most active sectors of investment right now, largely because I think 
I'll go back to the Citra organization that really f had started to focus there and do small experiments. So one, one uh, trend or one idea for almost any problem is not to try to take the whole thing at once, but to do smaller activities and, and test what works. So um, things like, you know, hackathons or, you know, workshops, whatever, that get people starting to focus on what the real problems are, um, I think are, are great things to do. Um, I do think, one thing I didn't talk about so much, but I, I actually met some professors yesterday and, and, and some officials, and I think very important to understand what your strengths are as a innovation community. So what are the things within sustainability that um, you have outstanding talent in here coming from the university or coming from research or coming from industry? So what are those things that are uh, different here? And then support kind of ideation and developing experiments around that. Um, so-called clean tech and sustainable investing, it's it's very, very hard area. It, it proved to be, it was the next big thing in Silicon Valley in the early 2000s, but never really worked out because it's just not like IT, and to a certain extent it's not like biotechnology and, and health sciences, is that it's, there's so many different systems, it's hard to build something that's globally scalable. So you do come to more let's call it social investing, where you need to attract capital that really is very patient. And that's, that's a challenge, and, and I think everybody struggles with that. But if I, if I think from the contrarian side, since nobody's done it very well, it also means that there's great opportunities for innovative clusters. So experiments, find, find small experiments and people that are committed to that. You know, what Finland has done in many countries, this is a s small kind of aside, but there's a new financial instrument called a social impact bond. So it's, it's not shares and it's not a loan, but it's in the middle to help sectors that make a big impact on society and maybe save a lot of costs or save lives or whatever, but, you know, they have a hard time getting capital. So basically the, the government uh, uh, operates as a middle person between the investment community and the service providers, entrepreneurs, and they promise the money back to the investors. And then the percentage interest rate that they receive back is based on how successful the measurable impact is. For example, if it saves you know, millions of costs uh, in the system, then that cost saving is shared with the investors. So I think that's actually a growing trend and, and a tool. And actually EU is starting to develop this and exercise it in different countries. So maybe it's something to look into here. Спасибо большое, коллеги. Есть ли еще вопросы? Да, пожалуйста. Давайте сначала здесь. Константин Коломиц, меня зовут Вилл. У меня такой вопрос вот в продолжение Валентина. Он спрашивал, говорил о проблемах нашего финансового рынка. Знаете, в Беларуси есть такая пословица. Если для решения проблемы нужны деньги, то это не проблема, это задача. Как бы, да? И вот все связано с, вокруг финансов. Как бы, да? Отсутствие развитого финансового рынка приводит к каким-то таким суррогатным схемам финансирования бизнеса. Как бы, да? Но я считаю, что это возможно на начальных стадиях и не так плохо. В связи с этим вопрос, вот при отсутствии рынка ценных бумаг, да, выход на IPO в Беларуси, ни, ни одна компания не котирует акции, нет богатых пенсионных фондов, как бы, да, вот насколько в Финляндии и прочих странах развиты форма натуральных грантов вхождения в венчурные компании в виде там, участка земли или вот допустим в двери обработки оборотным капиталом является лес как бы, да? для строительства инновационного какого-то дома нужно просто дать лес компании и она построит деревянный дом вот насколько такие формы развиты как бы? у нас законодательство не отрегулировано даже в этой сфере где вот имеется реальный капитал I'm trying to think how to formulate that. It, it's a, um, so, mm, 
Yeah. So, so I think a couple things. So, so first of all, you're correct that, I mean, capital markets in the end are going to be necessary to, to solve these problems. But you may, you know, it, it, and, and it'll take years to develop your own, own capital markets. So in, in Finland, I think um, the, the things we've done is to, is to kind of, first of all, look for partnership across countries on capital markets. So we, our, our capital market is closely uh, linked to Sweden, uh, Norway, and others. So I, I believe in a, a Baltic area kind of capital ecosystem. Um, so you're, you're, yeah, I'm thinking about um, kind of industry change. So we, we've lost the forestry industry in Finland, or we, we actually have, our forests are bigger and better than ever, but they're less valuable on a trading basis. And um, for the kind of changing the uh, employment around that, I guess there, you know, there've been state programs, EU support. I, I don't know. Could I ask to maybe restate the question a bit so I could I make sure I'm answering the right thing? I, I, I understand basically, but. Могли бы вы еще попробовать вот вы привести пример, да? Что вы имеете в виду? Какой вид финансирования? Для, любого, для реализации любого инвестиционного проекта, где есть материальная составляющая, там, строительство офиса, строительство гидроэлектростанции, как бы, да, нужна земля, нужен металл, возможно, для строительства деревянного дома можно взять лес, как бы, да, капитал в натуральной форме государства есть, и даже в Беларуси такой капитал есть. А в бюджете денег мало, в бюджете денег очень мало, как бы. и государство не хочет рисковать бюджетными деньгами. У государства есть другие проблемы, поэтому, вот, сам, на мой взгляд, тормозятся многие проекты, не могут быть реализованы по той простой причине, что нет источника финансирования. На мой взгляд, для реализации венчурных проектов может быть применена комбинированная схема финансирования из различных источников, не только живые деньги. It's good that we work together a long time so we can work towards the, all kinds of solutions. Um, similar, I, I guess similar dynamics have, have, have happened in Finland. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm actually, I, I guess maybe my fallback here is I'm, I'm not quite an expert on that one. So I, 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 don't, I don't have great examples. Um, You know, we have, you know, had some heavy industry um, that's, again, been largely state supported. So, but it's, but as you said, we have, we have a well kind of functioning uh, social system. So we're able to get the capital basically through, through taxing profits or whatever. Um, I need to think about that one. I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. I think that such complex schemes don't exist in the world. You're stumped experts. So, to bring an example is very difficult. I heard that in a natural form you can have a project. I just wanted to ask the Finns if they could ask about the tree production, like the leader of the tree production. My favorite topic. Thank you for the question. Another question, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Will, for your report you. and cases. Uh, May in Russian. Я Сергей Корнилов, предприниматель. Спасибо за вашу просветительскую деятельность. Это очень интересно. Скажите, Will, у вас есть личные планы в отношении нашей страны? Это была бы очень сложная. Практически, может быть, даже невыполнимая задача, но для вашей карьеры это был бы венец для вашей интересной карьеры. В дополнение, у нас есть прекрасная Татьяна Маринич, площадка Имагуру. 
еще есть интересные площадки, много э, молодых людей и не очень, вот, у которых да. есть инициатива. Да. Но тема сегодняшней э, нашей встречи – это да. государство и венчурные инвестиции. Yes. Yes. Спасибо. Yes. So, so yeah, so I, I love hard problems, so um, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to come to places like this. I mean, my, you know, I was born in a small town in Virginia, you know, a couple hundred kilometers from Washington, D.C., and it was, my family had lived there for hundreds of years, literally, and uh, for one reason or another, you know, I went away and studied, and um, I happened to one weekend meet a woman who uh, happened to be Finnish in 1985, and that ended up with this whole th thing where I, I've ended up. So I, I, I have a um, appreciation for how small things can ch make make big changes. Um, I. As I said, I, I started already in 1992 visiting, or 91, visiting the former Soviet Union at that point. So I was actually in St. Petersburg the, the day that, you know, the tanks started happening. So I already started seeing the interesting things happening. And uh, I, I just, I, I personally enjoy seeing when um, there's limited resources, but people that are very enthusiastic, I think, magic can happen and uh so yeah my i i enjoy going out and 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 seeing if i can catalyze something со своей стороны если позволите я могу тоже ответить на ваш вопрос прокомментировать участие уилла потому что конечно он здесь находится не просто не только для того чтобы вот один раз приехать в беларусь прежде всего мы начинаем большую работу по проекту iAdventure, который финансируется агентством США по международному развитию. И мы очень надеемся, что опыт Уилла будет полезен именно в этой работе. И это только первый шаг. Поэтому, да, я очень рада, что Уилл так легко воспринимает сложные проблемы. Думаю, что в Беларуси это не, не будет так сложно. Мне очень хочется в это верить, что это, этот путь будет интересным и и легким. Maybe if I, you know, I can add to that. Um, so I came to Finland in '96, and I, I, the one thing I'm confident about is I'm the only American and probably the only non-Fin that's been part of that for the whole time from '96 till today, um, which has surprised me. I, I expected there would be more, many more people that would come in and actually live inside, but. They come and they go in general. So I think my advantage is I've just seen a, a couple cycles because that's the important thing in this is that, you know, you may see one cycle. Like I saw the, the bubble happen and things were just fantastic in early 2000. And then there were disaster in 2001. So it's important to be able to go through cycles and then kind of learn from those. and. Um, And what I love about Minsk, and what I, I already was starting to talk to some people from here already years ago, and Tanya and I guess met already in 2011, to yeah, 12. 12. So she was looking for examples. And uh, so I've noticed several countries that have been really interested to kind of bring in external ideas. So there's been that curiosity. And then just the incredible talent, uh, right now, I'm. One of my personal interest areas is artificial intelligence, and I think that the best minds, some of the best minds in the world are here within a few kilometers. So the question is how to bring those in and uh, help use them to create growth. And I'm really fascinated around that. And by the way, that impacts many other areas, not only software, but robotics, uh, healthcare, you know, everything can potentially be affected. So I'd like another of my big ambitions is just to see human um, improvement in human well-being. That's where my investments go today. It's only into companies that are creating growth and well-being uh, impact. And I believe that artificial intelligence and others, they can be used really well or poorly. And I'd like to be around places that are trying to use it well.
И я со своей стороны еще, наверное, все-таки маленькое дополнение. Приоткрою завесу. Хотели объявить немножко позже и объявим об этом. Мы начинаем обучающую программу для инвесторов, для бизнес-ангелов, которые работают здесь, в Беларуси. Эта программа начнется в апреле, и вот как раз... Уилл uh, будет uh, преподавать в, uh, да, и работать с нашими бизнес-ангелами. Как мы все понимаем, uh, венчурным инвестициям тоже стоит учиться. Это, uh, это тоже наука. Да, и здесь uh, нашим бизнес-ангелам очень важно изучать международный опыт, uh, конкретные кейсы, конкретные примеры, конкретные примеры и удачи, и неудач. Конкретные, нужно учиться конкретным инструментам инвестирования, как работать с международными коллегами. И вот эту программу мы начинаем, я уже могу даже сказать конкретные даты, 10 апреля она стартует в Минске, и, но объявим официально, мы чуть-чуть попозже объявим старт этой программы и будем приглашать всех вас подавать заявки на участие в программе. One thing I'd, I'd like to add about uh, another key thing that the Finnish Business Angel Association has done is codify or kind of structure what we call sweat equity. I don't know if that's a term here yet, but um, it's basically in, you can invest many ways in companies. You can invest, of course, put your money there, but you can also put your time. And what's important is to figure out if you put your time, what could you expect back from the company? And uh, there's well kind of understood kind of terms and conditions that could be used because I also think that's, that's a key thing. If people have the right expertise to help a company, but they don't have time, then it doesn't do any good. So if they put an hour in, two hours in, they should learn what they should expect back. At a certain level, you're just being philanthropic and, and trying to kind of uh, improve yourself and the company. But if you start investing more and more time, you should get something back. And that's actually part of many business angel investments is they say, okay, I'll put 5,000 euros to this company and then I'll agree to do 1,000 euros worth of work every month to support that. And then they will get some shares also for that 1,000. So that's one other thing that I want to kind of uh, bring to this table here. Спасибо. Еще, может быть, вопросы есть? Пожалуйста. Значит, я Александр Успенский. Я представляю Республиканский центр трансфера технологий. Ну, так как мы занимаемся трансфером технологий, то основно, один из наших основных вопросов – это как привлечь инвестиции для коммерциализации технологий, созданных в нашей родной стране, в Беларуси. Поэтому вопрос у меня простой. Значит, первый. Разрешено ли финским вечерным фондам финансировать проекты, скажем, в Беларуси? Yes. Okay. So the answer is yes. Uh, so most of the, even the state... Ну, это коротко, да или нет? Да, да. So the answer is yes. Если можно, тогда, значит, у меня вопрос второй. Я бы хотел получить yep. э, базу данных тех финских венчурных фондов, которые хотят yep. инвестировать в проекты в Республику Беларусь. У нас на нашем сайте есть специальный раздел «Инвестиционные и венчурные фонды», которые, значит, по крайней мере, изъявили желание не каждый венчурный фонд готов финансировать и реализовывать проекты на территории Республики Беларусь. Вы можете зайти, посмотреть фонд, какие требования к оформлению проектов, какие требования к проектам, потому что оформить проект для вечерного фонда – это очень сложно, я подчеркиваю. Это стоит больших денег, если делать это профессионально, и вы хотите получить деньги. Но просто для… раз я уже вот… Сказать, столкнулись с представителем, который представляет Финляндию в данном случае, то мы с удовольствием, если вы нам дадите ссылку или базу данных саму, значит, мы разместим ее, так сказать, на нашем сайте, чтобы вы все могли зайти и посмотреть, что нужно сделать, чтобы получить деньги в финском венчурном фонде. Могу сказать, в любом венчурном фонде это деньги получить очень тяжело. Yes. So let me make a couple points about that. So first of all, thank you for saying that. Um, 
I actually ran technology transfer at Alto University for a number of years, so I was doing exactly what you're doing. <laughs> I was going, because we had beautiful things that nobody was investing in. And um, so I, I really like a few things you said. First of all, so you have on your website a list of the technologies, uh, I guess, or, or um, so it's... No technologies. Me interested список венчурных фондов. So very important. So so there are about five thousand projects. Please. I just if we look at what are the venture funds that are ready to invest in the Republic of Belarus, what are the requirements for projects? We can help them to choose these projects. So, so I think that's, um, I think it's really interesting, and, and actually the, the place that's done this fantastically well is Israel. They have the best tech transfer marketing kind of organization. So I'll share some of these things with you. There, I would say of, the, of those funds that I showed, um, I would say five, three to five are, would invest in the right opportunity. Russia. Now, again, the legal issues and others have to be solved somehow. Um, but like I said, if there's, if it's the best solution to a problem in the world, the money will come. So the key is exactly what you're doing to communicate that out so the right investors find find them. And I, I certainly want to help with this during the time period because I believe you that okay, we had. If you have 5,000 technologies, then there might, that might, uh, they might not all be perfect, but, um, but there's certainly some that will have, have, have potential for international investment. Yes, if we're talking about our clients, it's the government's organization. Одна из крупнейших, yep. понятно, это Академия наук, потому что в основном все технологии создаются в Беларуси, это создается в, в Академии наук. Около 400 технологий ежегодно э, создается. Mm -hmm. Но также мы сотрудничаем и с частными фирмами, и с физическими лицами. И если говорить про диапазон сумм, которые хотят получить наши клиенты для реализации своих mm -hmm. проектов, то они колеблются где-то от 10 тысяч долларов до полутора миллиардов долларов. Поэтому... Well, в зависимости от ваших пожеланий, я yeah. думаю, что мы вам подберем. Самое главное, чтобы вы хотели вложить yeah. деньги в проект на территории Республики sure. Беларусь прежде всего. Но think... нюансы yeah. могут быть какие. Вы знаете, что у нас есть союзное yeah. государство, Беларусь, Россия. Yeah. То есть, yeah. если вам не нравится площадка Республики Беларусь, можно проект реализовать на территории России. Вот. Есть у нас а. еще такая структура, как Евразес. Не нравится в Беларуси и России, можем в Казахстане mm -hmm. реализовать. У нас есть партнеры, значит, Казахстан. в 23 okay. странах мира. Поэтому и, и даже в Китае. Литвания? Литвания входит в этот список? Литва, значит, есть партнеры, но... Нет. Yep. You do. Yep. Там нет. So I think... Она входит в ЕС, это там другой разговор. Okay, so, so I think there, there, there's a lot of, lot of interesting things there. The thing you have to keep in mind is I don't think anybody is specifically looking to invest in Belarus. They're looking to invest in the best projects. And if, if the best projects are here, the investment will come, it's, as long as you communicate what they are, because I think nobody invested in something they didn't know existed. That's a, that's a fundamental kind of a principle. But you're doing the right thing and I'm happy to help and give some ideas there. Я почему задавал этот вопрос вам? Потому что если у нас один из крупнейших партнеров это Китай, то, например, в китайским вещенным фондом до 2016 года было запрещено вкладывать деньги в зарубежные проекты на законодательном уровне. Только 2016 года и мы разрешили. Вот. И у нас на территории страны, right. рядом с Минском, есть э, сейчас э, китайско-белорусский технопарк «Великий камень», где можно реализовывать проекты, подключать yes. yeah. сюда китайскую сторону. 
Спасибо большое. Коллеги, есть ли еще вопросы? Thanks. Дмитрий Морозов, Гуменский технопарк. Спасибо за прекрасное выступление еще раз. У меня будет два вопроса, если можно, к обоим Пожалуйста. ведущим сегодняшнего мероприятия. Ну, Во-первых, хотел спросить, какие есть государственные инструменты в Финляндии? Опыт частного венчурного финансирования, государственного. Как вы сравниваете их эффективность да, вот на этом рынке, на этом поле? И Татьяна, хотел у вас, как, в принципе, как у эксперта, в этой теме, как вы вообще оцениваете ситуацию с венчурным финансированием в Беларуси, вот кроме того проекта, который вы сейчас при поддержке американского посольства, что у нас, что, что у нас ждет дальше, где белорусский инновационный фонд и так далее. Мы все патриоты страны, мы понимаем, что ну, бесплатный сыр, мы, мы знаем, где бывает. Хотелось бы, чтобы появились отеч отечественные инструменты венчурного финансирования. Ну вот ваш прогноз, ваша оценка, это очень больная тема. Спасибо. Спасибо. Я даже позволю себе тоже... У меня, кстати, когда yeah. я слушала Уилла, был тоже вопрос в этой, в этой области, потому что Уилл упоминал несколько государственных фондов, которые вкладывают деньги в стартапы на разных стадиях. И вечный вопрос и боль для нашего государства, да, и очень интересно, как он решается в Финляндии, это как измерить эффективность этих инвестиций. Да, готовы ли государство терять деньги, готовы ли государство тоже терпеть неудачи, да, как мы видели из презентации, что в общем неудачи могут быть у всех, да, и у предпринимателей, и у государства в том числе. Или может быть у государства есть какие-то другие так называемые KPI да, для измерения эффективности yeah, right. венчурного капитала, государственного венчурного yeah. капитала. So important, very important point. Um, so, how do I say this? Uh, I think the KPIs start on these innovation plans. They're related to activity rather than results which is an important thing. So you try to support the things that are doing, doing the right way for growth and for job creation and everything. But if you only look every year at how many jobs are created, then you're going to get a, a bad view of, of whether you're succeeding or not. So, so the, what, what's been done, and I have very concrete things on this, by the way. There's a program called the Young Innovative Companies Program. Very specific to companies that do not have revenues yet, have an innovation, have risk. And they give a little bit of money bit by bit based on milestones. So in the milestones of the business are not necessarily, at least in the beginning, how much money they're earning, they're how successful the product development is going, how much their business plan and business concept is improving, are they hiring international people, are they going to international events, what are the drivers to success? So they're measuring these drivers instead of specifically how much money are they earning. Because if you, if, you, if you measure how much money they're earning too early, they don't put enough effort in research and development and business development. They're only trying to sell. And they don't have actually build competitive products. So this program is designed to be able to see very early on are companies doing the right thing. And there are people that are trained on this measurement uh, strategies, and there are people with target uh, with the job to collect data from the companies every quarter, every half year, um, and uh, and then allocate money based on that. So, you know, it, I've seen companies that actually had large sales increases, but they didn't do their research and development and their basic activities, and they didn't get more funding. Whereas companies that actually didn't have sales come in, but they were doing the right things in business development, they did get state funding. 
So it's very important that KPIs uh, are set correctly to support people doing the right thing. So one of the key milestones is always do you bring private outside money into the company because the state wants to see that it's there are others that think this is a good idea because it used, it used to be that the state would try to choose the winners and they would give subsidies and whatever to these chosen industries but today the state would like to see that the private sector is showing it where the successes are possible and then it supports it. So an interesting thing, like, like Tanya says, you know, if you look at subsidies that st every state gives to different industries, they're not getting direct, you're, they're not necessarily getting, you know, increased taxes or whatever from that. They're supporting, you know, industries that may be failing. So the money is being lost anyway. So. One of, the, one of the things we shut down in Finland just recently was the direct state ownership of shares in private companies. So very young private companies. So still we have this public sector may own big growth shipyard, you know, companies working in shipyards or heavy industry. So that's, that's okay in a way because they're fairly stable industries but they don't own pure startups. And they used to, actually there was, a, for 10 years there was a program where there was direct state investment into shares. And that program was not, a, was not successful. It was a learning experience. But what we found is it was much better that the state would support private fund managers who would then invest into those. And then monitor the fund managers because the fund managers need to treat tax money as, as, uh, as uh, carefully as it does its private ec uh, investors, but still it's possible. Спасибо большое. Я с удовольствием отвечу на ваш вопрос, потому что по о, о том, в какой стадии развития находится сегодня белорусская венчурная экосистема, как раз буквально завтра мы, я буду делать презентацию по итогам исследования, которые мы проводили, исследования венчурной экосистемы. Мы опрашивали три группы участников экосистемы, это инвесторы, субъекты поддержки и стартапы. И ну, не буду сейчас раскрывать всех деталей, секретов, но хочу сказать, что в целом э, игроки рынка, да, да и я, они смотрят с большим оптимизмом на то, что происходит сегодня. То есть рынок есть, он находится на ранней стадии развития, это растущий рынок. И, ну, и мы знаем историю успеха белорусских стартапов. Да? То есть, есть талант, есть инженерный талант, есть успешные стартапы, которые находятся и работают внутри Беларуси и за рубежом. Они все больше и больше привлекают внимание иностранные венчурные фонды. Ну вот тоже пример, например, известный акселератор, Уилл его сегодня упоминал, стартап Сауна, финский акселератор. Кстати говоря, этот акселератор своего рода использует уникальную бизнес-модель. Он приглашает на программу, по-моему, 5 недель или чуть больше месяца стартапы из Финляндии, из других стран мира, которые проходят определенный, определенный отбор и не берет equity. То есть государство помогает акселератору развивать и финские, и международные команды. Это очень интересная и редкая на сегодняшний день бизнес-модель. Так вот, к чему я говорю, что каждый раз, мы, по-моему, с 2012 года да, или 2013 года проводим соревнования стартап-сауна в Минске, и в этом году это соревнование будет 24 марта, мы уже, по-моему, даже объявили, да, и приглашаем белорусские стартапы аппликаться на эту программу. Так вот, каждый год один или даже две команды из Беларуси попадают в этот акселератор. Это говорит о чем? О том, что есть перспективные стартапы в Беларуси. И с другой стороны, еще один очень интересный вывод исследования, который, о котором подробнее буду завтра говорить в презентации, о том, что в Беларуси есть не только стартапы, но есть и деньги. 
То есть есть инвесторы, которые готовы инвестировать капитал в стартап-компании. А чего не хватает, спрашивается, да, раз все так хорошо. Ну, базовых вещей, фундаментальных, на мой взгляд. Правовая система, правовая среда, то есть условия для того, чтобы сделки совершались именно здесь, в Беларуси. И это как раз то, над чем мы планируем работать в рамках проекта Adventure, одна из основных вещей. И вторая тоже такой столб, да, очень важная, фундаментальная вещь, это образование. Причем образование, которое необходимо как инвесторам, так и стартапам. И если у стартап-компаний таких возможностей было, на мой взгляд, чуть больше, вот и, и Магуру делают очень много, и другие игроки экосистемы, стартап-школы есть, то есть все больше и больше приглашают различных экспертов для того, чтобы стартапы могли получать эти новые знания и учиться. А вот, вот со стороны инвестиций здесь был определен такой ну, гэп, реальный гэп. То есть инвестору, если только он не прекрасно говорит по-английски, он очень хочет учиться и поступает там, в западную бизнес-школу или на западную программу, да, он может повышать свой уровень знаний. Здесь не было до сегодняшнего момента ни одной возможности в принципе, получить знания инвестору. И вот такие возможности открываются. Мне кажется, это даст колоссальный толчок. Мне не верится, что эти вещи, если они будут, измен... то есть, если вот мы сейчас будем делать первые шаги, они дадут определенные определенное движение создадут уже в течение одного, двух, трех лет. Это не долгосрочные инвестиции. Я имею в виду инвестиции вот в образование, да, в, то есть, да, потенциально они тоже, чем больше будет инвесторов в Беларуси, чем, если будет расти наше сообщество бизнес-ангелов, безусловно, это, как и Уилл приводил пример в Финляндии, это будет готовить почву для последующих стадий инвестирования, прекрасную почву. Но нужно начинать с чего-то малого, с чего-то конкретного, то есть то, что может дать результат уже в ближайшие годы. И вот изменение правовой среды и образования – это те вещи, которые, как, на мой взгляд, могут принести так сами нами ожидаемый результат. Ну вот это мое мнение, да, а чуть больше деталей уже завтра я позволю себе не раскрывать все цифры исследований. Там очень много интересных, даже для нас, для, собственно, команды, которая делала это исследование, было много открытий, поэтому приглашаю, кстати, всех вас завтра в 2 часа на презентацию, она будет здесь же, в бизнес-клубе Имагуру. Пожалуйста, приходите, вход свободный, и, я думаю, будет много инвесторов и представителей госорганов и средств массовой информации. Так что э, ждем всех вас э, завтра. Ну и я позволю себе завершить сегодняшнюю встречу. Э, напоминаю, что э, у нас будет сейчас нетворкинг, мы все неформально сможем общаться, по, вы сможете задать Виллу, Виллу уже вопросы э, личного характера или там, э, те вопросы, которые вы не смогли задать сейчас, если у вас еще остались. И хочу поблагодарить, конечно, нашего эксперта. Большое спасибо, Уилл. И большое спасибо агентству США по международному развитию за поддержку этого ивента и, конечно, проекта Adventure. Ольга, у тебя еще есть какое-то напоминание. Да, я знаю, что Ольга и члены нашей команды раздавали вам анкеты. Да, большая просьба тоже их заполнить. Это важно, потому что мы должны понять, кого вы видите, хотите видеть на следующей встрече и какой формат встреч вам наиболее удобен. Спасибо огромное.